Oh, there we go. All right. Uh, I'm going to talk about automatic visualization. This is not a product demo. I'm going to give you a brief uh, run through the product, uh, this part of the product, uh, driverless AI. But uh, what I want to really do for you is show you uh, how um, you do this stuff. How do you do automatic visualization uh, in uh, the context of machine learning? So let's just take a, uh, I'm now running driverless AI, and I'm going to take a data set that involves wines uh, on 14 different features, and I'm going to just say visualize, and this is what the program does. It generates a set of graphics that it thinks are interesting and you should look at to be able to understand a little more before you ever do a model. And I stress that fact that you should, in my opinion, always do this before you run driverless AI and fit any kind of model. It's important to understand what do your data look like. Now the program, depending on the data set, will print different graphs almost every time. So it isn't a fixed set of graphs. In this case, it found out, for example, that there are a bunch of histograms of the features of the columns of the data set that are quite skewed. And that, for example, might indicate to you that you or the program should be looking at transformations to symmetrize uh, the variables. That uh, skewness can be input uh, to many machine learning algorithms, but it's often better to work with symmetrical data sets, uh, or, or variables, rather. Now, um, this biplot is a bit technical, so I won't go into details. But the distinguishing aspect of it is that, in this case, it's the first two principal components uh, of the uh, data set. And we have this strange V-shaped pattern. And normally, we'd expect to see a schmear, kind of um, uh, spherical or elliptical kind of shape, which we're not seeing here, and warrants further examination. Now, the one I'm going to talk about most is outliers, because this program uses a unique and recent published algori uh, algorithm, which I developed for looking at outliers in high dimensional space. Um, in this case, it's showing you single uh, dimensional outliers. That is, does any variable you're looking at or feature, I use variable and feature equivalently in this talk, and do you see outliers? Uh, and the program actually identifies those outliers statistically. That is to say, it's based on a probability model, not just like, let's look for an outlier. Oh, this looks big. Uh, this actually allows you to set a confidence level. In this case, it's one times out of 100. In statistics, we call that the critical value. And then we only accept an outlier if it exceeds that level. Well, uh, there are other things like a heat map. Um, and for the wines, we see that they're at the bottom here. This, by the way, is the data transpose, so they fit on the screen better. But um, there are three types of wines, evidently, looking at the color scheme. And then we have all the other variables have been ordered. Re they've been permuted so that similar variables are near each other. Um, and uh, finally, there's this rather bizarre graph. This is called a spider web plot or a star plot. If any of you have heard of parallel coordinates, well, this is polar parallel coordinates. And the important thing is not to look at the mess. We're really not interested. Those are all the cases or rows in the data set just plotted as a bunch of profiles. But there are two cases here that are multivariate outliers. As I touch those, they turn green. There's one, and there's the other in the middle. And interestingly, these multivariate outliers don't often show up in ordinary, say, histogram displays. Well, I've showed you enough of the, oh, here's just one other quick one called the correlation graph. This puts variables, uh, like in this case, magnesium. It's written, as I brushed it, it's a tiny word. but puts variables near each other if they're highly correlated. Now, that's, in terms of modeling, 
if you found two variables that are perfectly correlated, there's no point in entering them both because there's no information gained after you've added one. When you add the other, you're gaining no information whatsoever if it's perfectly correlated. And this display will tell you that. All right, let's move on uh, to um, the, uh, how this is done. Um, PowerPoint gets more complicated every year. All right, here we go. First of all, we face a problem. In a company like ours, or in any place where you're trying to visualize big data, that uh, it's, a, it's a problem. You can't analyze big data sets. First of all, because of complexity. That is, if you have lots of features, there are many algorithms that, statistical ones at least, that are exponential or polynomial. And if you have a 1,000 variables, you can't, you can't look at those data in reasonable time. There's something called the curse of dimensionality. Uh, and that means that uh, distances tend toward a constant as, uh, uh, is it rendering right now? Yeah, it doesn't seem to like latex typesetting. And, all right, distances tend toward a constant. Distances between points in a high dimensional space tend toward a constant as the dimensionality approaches infinity. And then the choke point, of course, even if we could get good estimates and visualize, we can't send big data over the wire. And even if we could, we can't plot big data on the client because you've only got so much real estate, even in megapixel displays. You haven't got anything like the number of pixels needed to plot, say, a billion rows of data. There are cheesy solutions that people have published papers on, and I use the word cheesy advisedly. These are kind of quick shortcuts that don't solve the problem. You can pixelate. That is to say you can use one pixel for a point, but you're going to run quickly out of pixels, as I said, even a megapixel display. Something everyone loves is uh, to project. Like we're told, just use T, S, and E and, and project it all into two dimensions. Now we can see all the cases. Doesn't work. As you take high dimensionality and put it down to two dimensions, say, you're violating the, almost certainly violating the triangle inequality. That means, in this case, two points that are close together in your plot in TSNE aren't necessarily relatively close together in high dimensions. Um, you can use other things like image maps and so on. What I'm going to show you is our technology, and this uh, I derived from uh, algorithms that John Hartigan the statistician student at John Tukey's devised years ago for aggregation uh, uh, for large problems. And then, yes, we are going to project in some cases, but we're only going to project down to relatively lower dimension, like 50 dimensions or 100, so we don't run into that 2D problem. Now, how does aggregation work? Well, the algorithm um, we've devised uh, basically centers circles, in this case in 2D, or balls, or hyperballs in high dimensions, on certain points in the data, in that space. And then all other points that are within the radius of the ball, think of it as sort of a delta neighborhood, they're, they're comparable to the exemplar that's at the central point. We put them in that same. This is very different from clustering, some people think you can use k-means clustering. Again, not a solution to this problem because k-means doesn't work very well in high dimensions. And more importantly, all the balls in k-means are different sizes, different radii. What we're trying to do is not cluster. We're trying to do something like we're doing a set cover. Uh, it's something like core sets that are used in geometric uh, uh, problems. And you see on the right that we end up with far fewer points but we actually get a picture. The density of the points, the configuration, is almost the same as the original. Now, let's talk about a, a favorite to topic of mine, which is outliers. Um, I have, in this case, generated x, y, and z, uh, three variables. They're Gaussian, that is to say, normal 
random variables with mean zero, standard deviation one, and I'm predicting z, the third one of them, from the other two. And here's what happens when you take an ordinary regression problem, program, and do the prediction. You get a nice flat plane because there is no prediction. Everything's random. Um, so I ran driverless AI on this problem, and it works beautifully. You notice in the red circle that the root mean squared error is almost exactly one, which is what it should be, because z has a standard deviation of one, and there's no prediction. So now I did this. I added one outlier. Now this is an example, well known, where ordinary least squares and the use of a quadratic loss function is a very bad idea. Because in fact, R squared for this plane, uh, where that point on the left, lower left, is all 999 points, and then there's one more point on the far right, and the fit's almost perfect. So R squared is like 0.999 for this example. So what happens with driverless AI? We get 94. That's not good. <laughs> in other words, that one outlier is just ruining uh, our model. We're giving it too much weight. So what are we going to do about this? I, this is why I am saying you should always look at AutoViz before you start up driverless AI, or for that matter, any other machine learning program. Now, these are a few definitions of what outliers really are. The term is often used loosely and in incorrectly. Uh, outliers are a type of anomaly, but I distinguish general anomalies uh, based on observations that are inconsistent with your prior beliefs. This is a Bayesian kind of a definition. But an outlier is an observation inconsistent with a set of points, I claim, because these points are embedded, uh, they're uh, based on a random process in a vector space. Um, all outliers, in other words, are anomalies, but not all anomalies are outliers. Uh, some anomalies are logical or even mathematical, but outliers are probabilistic. An outlier detection has a 200-year history, and you're going to find hundreds of algorithms. And I'm going to tell you, read these three books. If you've read any review more recent than these three books and haven't read these three books, then you're learning a lot of misinformation. That happens to be my advice as someone who's been teaching statistics for 40 years. Um, all the major outlier methods are outlined in these books. Of course, there have been some since then, but I'll give you some examples of where some of the reviews are simply flat out wrong. Wikipedia, obviously, is flat out wrong. Well, I shouldn't say obviously, but in this case, it's wrong. L let me show you. There there are two kinds of ways of thinking about outliers. The first is the classical way, and this is the hundreds of year old way, and that is an outlier is a point that is very far from some central location for the batch of numbers. Uh, and in most cases, like on the left, it's something far away from the mean. But on the right, it's, uh, as John Tukey would define it, uh, it's something far away from the median. However, I've drawn a box plot here of some data with so-called outliers, and they're not outliers. So you will see in some recent reviews, here's a neat way to do outliers, to find outliers. Just draw box plots. Wrong. The reason is very simple. N, the number of rows in the data set, is not even in Tukey's formula. And he never intended that to be an outlier detection method. He called them outliers, but the reason he wanted them out there, and he pulled the whiskers, notice, in closer toward the middle of the data, is he didn't want those whiskers to misrepresent the density of the data. So it wasn't an outlier detection method. Now, the second, second one that's more recent is the gaps rule, and actually we owe a lot of this to Tukey as well. In this case, an outlier can be an inlier. You notice that red point is far away from both sets of data. So you look for the nearest neighbor of a point. And if that is f quite far away, and we'll give it a more formal definition later, but far away from all the other points, it's an outlier or an inlier. 
Now this generalizes beautifully to the multivariate case. I'm, let's go to two dimensions here from one. The upper one is the distance from the center rule. And in this case, I'm showing an example uh, where the outliers are defined in terms of something called Mahalanobis distance, the great Indian statistician uh, who uh, founded uh, Indian Statistical Institute in Calcutta. Um, that red point next to the ellipse is indeed an outlier, even though it looks actually closer to the center of that ellipse than some of the other points. It's a good method if you happen to know that data are bivariate normal which is not usually the case. The gaps rule generalizes, generalizes beautifully also. Notice those two points are far away from their nearest neighbors, so we might consider them outliers. Now, this is the algorithm uh, uh, that um, the driverless AI encapsulates for, and I published this last month in a uh, transactions on visual analytics and computer graphics journal. You can, you can find uh, uh, copies of that online. I'm not gonna go through the details of this, ex simply, except simply to jump down to 0.5. We do compute that nearest neighbor distance after we've done that pre-processing. And then what's unique is we fit an exponential distribution to the largest distances because those nearest neighbor distances in the extreme actually do follow an exponential the way a lot of other distributions in the upper tails do follow an exponential as well. So that means we can actually get a probability for whether something's an outlier. Now, I, I, I can't go through the details of this slide in the next one except to point out a couple of popular misconceptions about outliers. Low dimensional projections are not a reliable uh, way to discover high dimensional outliers. Everyone says, oh, just plot your data. No, it doesn't work. Uh, right here is uh, counter examples, uh, and I can go into this in more detail with you if you wish individually. And paradoxically, these very popular plots, particularly parallel coordinates, and scatter plot matrices, popularly called SPLOMs, cannot be used to find outliers. Um, on the left are two real outliers, and yet look at that, they're kind of in the middle of all that gray area where all the other cases are. And that's because in high dimensional spaces, outliers lurk, they hide out among all the others. They happen to be far away from their nearest neighbor, but when you project them down like this into things like parallel coordinates, they get concealed. So you can't do this. Also, popular machine al learning algorithms are not a reliable way. There's a very popular one used here on the left called local outlier factor. It's a very clever idea. It's actually fairly close to my algorithm that I just outlined for you, and it's a very good procedure, but it has no concept of probability. There's sort of an ad hoc notion that if you see a large local outlier factor, it's an outlier. But here's an example from the web where someone ran it and labeled all those red points, and in fact, none of them are outliers. The sample is too small. All right. Now there's one other thing in the, in the display I told you about, and that was unusual scatter plots uh, when we looked at autoviz. And that's simply scatter plots that look weird. And we don't want to show you all the scatter plots, so how do we get those? Well, first of all, this is based on an idea of John Tukey's that I learned about many years ago, and uh, John and Paul Tukey never ran with it. Uh, and I thought it was a brilliant idea. So I and my grad students devised a graph theoretic approach to measuring the shape of a set of points in uh, a scatter plot. Each of these graphs that you see below there is a subset of this so-called Delaunay triangulation. So you can compute that triangulation and you can get all three of those without much of any additional computation. Now I'll just race through these to show you that these particular things, that minimum spanning tree and so on, 
have lots of information about shape, like are the points convex? Are they skinny? Are they stringy? Do they have skewed distances? Are they clumpy? Uh, which is very important if you find like males here, females there, it's good to know. Outlying, sparse, striated, and so on. In fact, when you make these computations in the computer, you actually can do things like do a scatter plot of scatter plots. It's sort of like an indirection, right? Sort of like a pointer. Each scatter plot is a data point. And look at how beautifully they're organized. In this case, on the left, that's something called the biplot. And when you actually plot them, indeed, that's what they look like. Or on the right, you can see these nine scagnostic measures. And again, the right side of that um, array there is a strong value on that scagnostic. And the left side is a weak. And, and they make perfect sense. That donut, for example, is not clumpy in the third row. But the three clusters on the right are clumpy. And the scagnostics picks up on that. Now. Um, uh, one of my grad students went on to do an actual entire visualization pipeline of things like scatter plots. And some of that gets incorporated into AutoVis. And what he did was compute scagnostics on that scatter plot matrix, then cluster them, and then abstract them into classes of scatter plots, and then further analysis. This use of scagnostics, which we haven't done yet in AutoVis, but uh, plan to, is um, here. Uh, well, I'm sorry. I don't have time to do it. Uh, let me just uh, show you again uh, and describe what this thing does. Here is thousands and thousands of pictures. They were coded into scagnostics because my grad student went, ran with the idea that a picture is a scatter plot. Might be in color, but you can still encode every pixel of the picture as a point in a space and do this analysis. He then went on to devise code to cluster analyze those pictures. And in the operation of the program, everything wiggles around, and the clusters finally converge. And this is what you see. You'll see in this enormous data set pictures of dinosaurs, leopard skins, pictures of views, and so on. In this example, he sucked all the images off his hard disk. Uh, very fast, much faster in terms of its encoding and, and uh, scoring than things like deep learning models. Um, then there's, uh, 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 we get to AutoViz, and this was what sort of prompted the idea. Um, was a, a work that uh, Graham Wills and I did some years ago called AutoViz. And AutoViz was a program, I hope this executes, it looks like this. There's the instruction manual, the entire manual. We go and get a file like, uh, oh, a copy of Moby Dick. Drag it in there, and it knows the data were words, and it does an n-gram analysis. But we go ahead and drag a uh, uh, file of statistical data on baseball players, and it knows those are numerical and, and string values, and it does an analysis of that. Notice on the upper part of this, by the way, is the graph I drew you as the correlation graph. How about just drag in a painting of Jackson Pollock? It knows it's a JPEG and contains uh, hue, saturation, and brightness channels. And it even has, it figures out, we'll do a 3D plot, and you see the small, tight range that Pollock used in the painting. Well, this program, you can drag almost anything in there, including your hard drive, and it will know what to do with it, which is what led us uh, to think about 
um, how this would work in a machine learning context. And uh, so, that was the first incarnation of these ideas in the context of an automatic visualization program. This you've already seen is an example. This has a few other things like a missing value heat map. AutoViz finds the missing values in your data, permutes the rows and the columns to see whether the missing values are completely at random or simply at random to quote terminology used by Don Rubin who uh, devised uh, the missing value analytic uh, model that's widely used today, uh, multiple imputation. So I'll conclude by uh, just talking about some future plans. I showed you the graphs in AutoViz, but you can't yet touch a point and find out where the point is in the data. So we're going to do that. We're going to, you touch a point, and up will pop who that point is. Something even more radical, I think, is we're going to generate a case weight vector where if AutoViz tells you you should exclude missing values, it's going to make case weights of zero for the rows that have missing values. It also will go further and suggest new features you should add. Now, Auto uh, DAI, driverless AI, already does that, but the repertoire of things that I've shown you actually generate are potentially able to generate features that are not included in the repertoire of uh, DAI at the moment. We're going to animate some of these visualizations to give you uh, some, uh, uh, a little more engagement. And we're going to add more natural language explanations uh, to the graphics. So thanks. Uh, if you have questions, I'd be happy to take them, <laughs> try to be quick. Uh. What I'm going to do is I'm going to give Leland my phone so he can review the questions and then he'll stick around for a couple of minutes and, and you can ask him the questions. Um, but I know you might want to go get your lunch, but he does have all the questions that yeah, you I, have. I could probably get some of these pretty fast. Okay. The outlier detection algorithm is published. Uh, was, it's coming out in transactions on, uh, it was part of the Viz Week uh, uh, meetings uh, about a month ago, and it's coming out in TVCG. Um, yes, the radar plot does automatically highlight the outliers. Those were the red contours. And in the future, you'll be able to click on them, and you'll see who it is. Uh, oh. Ah, uh, yes. <laughs> Here's someone sent a link to the R package, which um, I, I developed with uh, a person at Tableau. And yes, the, the, the link goes, if you just go to CRAN, if you're an R user, you can find hdoutliers.pdf. And that, that'll give you, it's, it's open source and available. Uh, why use a correlation graph and not a correlation heat map? Actually, the heat map I showed you is a correlation heat map in the sense that it actually permutes the rows and columns using the correlations between them. So that should, uh, uh, yeah, cover it. Uh, there you go. Yeah. Thank Leland. Thank you very much. Uh.